Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time of the 1976 remake, King Kong. Now, this film definitely does not live up to its grand tagline, which is the most original, exciting motion picture event of all time. It is not the most original motion picture event of all time. It's a remake of the 1933 film of the same name. It's also not the most exciting movie of all time either, but it's still not that bad of a film. It's still a pretty entertaining movie in its own right. You see, for many years, for pretty much most of my life, this was the King Kong film that I grew up with. This was the King Kong film that I liked the most. I really had not seen the 1933 film all the way through until fairly recently when I decided to review the King Kong films for my channel. So, I was not one of those people that grew up with the 1933 film. I grew up with the 1976 remake and the sequel, King Kong Lives. And for the longest time, the only King Kong movie I had on DVD until the Peter Jackson King Kong movie came out what, and I don't even have that on DVD either. I didn't buy that until recently. The only King Kong film I had on DVD was King Kong Lives. And I still have that DVD. But yeah, I know. I psh, That's the only one I had. And it wasn't until a while back when I also got the 2005 King Kong. I picked up the 1976 remake of King Kong. And you're probably wondering, how did I grow up with the film if I didn't have it on DVD? Well, I had it on VHS. I had it on this Paramount Collector Series VHS that had, like, gold on the cover and everything. I wish I still had it because I really like the look of those VHS tapes. But anyway, I, I watched this movie multiple times growing up. I probably wore the tape out. That's how much I watched it. So, yeah, I was, a, I was a fan of the 1976 King Kong from a very young age. And after revisiting again for the first time in a while, I would have to say it still holds up quite well. I mean, I do notice more things about it that I'm not a fan of than before. And I, if I had to choose between this and the 1933 film, I actually would give a slight edge to the 1933 film over this remake. But I still feel that this remake is pretty underrated and it does a lot of good things and it's honestly a lot better than a lot of critics give it credit for. I definitely do feel that this is not this is an overlooked movie and I think it's a classic in its own right and I also feel that this is not one of those movies that doesn't deserve to be released on Blu-ray in the U.S. For some reason it's only on Blu-ray overseas. I think it's a Japanese Blu-ray and it's out of print and it's already expensive. So... Uh, it's region free, but it's also extremely hard to find. Well, I mean, not extreme. I mean, you can get it on Amazon, but it's like really, it's, pr it's really pricey right now. So I, I think this deserves a much better transfer. I think it deserves a Blu-ray release loaded with features, uh, because I honestly think this was a pretty entertaining movie. I, I, I don't think it's nearly as bad as people make it out to be. It's not even anywhere near close to being on the same level as King Kong lives. And also, I honestly prefer this over Peter Jackson's King Kong. I really do. So, King Kong is a film directed by John Gillerman, who, before this, directed The Towering Inferno. So, that kind of... It was a nice choice because this was... Similar to The Towering Inferno in a way that it was a monster movie in the vein of a 70s disaster film. I think that's a perfect way to look at this film. It's like it's an epic in size and scope. It's a 70s epic, but it's also a 70s disaster movie in a lot of different ways. Um, there were some disastrous things about this film, which I, I got to be honest, I really didn't really care for uh, when I watched this again. But I'll talk about those later. But there weren't really as many disastrous things about this as I thought there was going to be. I thought this wasn't going to date well, or I thought it wasn't going to be an entertaining movie. Like, I don't know, maybe I just thought, like, oh, I grew up with this movie. You know, as a kid, I was able to look past more of its flaws, and as an adult, it's not going to... I'm not going to be able to do that. But no, uh, for the most part, I thought there were a lot of things that this film did right, and it did them really well. Uh, 
Gilliman's direction, I think, was definitely one of those things. I would say it's one of his uh, finest efforts. Uh, he ta it's a very titanic undertaking to do a remake of such a beloved movie as King Kong. And th there, it has divided a lot of people. There's people who are huge fans of the 1933 film who just hate this movie with a passion because it's a remake of the 1933 film. For them, there's only one King Kong, and it's a 1933 movie, and nothing else can even come close. And there's other people who are also fans of the 1933 Kong, but they're also fans of this. And I think that's pretty cool. And it's also fine with me if there's people out there who don't like this and hate it and hate its guts and want to stomp on it and because they prefer the 1933 film over any other Kong film, and that's fine. I just think that this movie has its own merits that I honestly think are being overlooked by a lot of people. It's got a rotten rating and rotten tomatoes. Even a lot of critics back when it came out weren't really that keen on it. Um, it does have its issues, but I don't think its problems are that big. I don't think they're as big as Kong, for instance, in this movie. So... John Gillerman, he was a very steady hand for this production. I've heard there were some problems on set, like he would, there would be fights with the producers and stuff like that, and he threatened to leave. There's a lot of crazy stuff that goes that was uh, mentioned in this excellent book, which I highly recommend this book. I cannot recommend this book enough. The creation of Dino De Laurentiis, King Kong by Bruce Berenberg. Even if you're not a fan of the movie... I highly recommend you find this paperback, you pick it up, and you read it. Because it is an engrossing, entertaining, extremely detailed uh, look at the production of this film. It's It's got all kinds of wonderful stuff, notes about the production, um, really cool behind-the-scenes photographs. It is a must-own for any fan of the film. And it's also a must own for anyone who's interested in, you know, behind the scenes books uh, that talk about the making of movies and things like that. Because this is just, I remember when I got this, I think it was a while back, and I was just blown away by how detailed and how much stuff is in this book. I mean, it's like 200 something pages, and it's all detailed with all this kind of stuff. It's the most comprehensive look at the making of the movie that you can ever get your hands on. There's no making of documentary on the DVD. There's no hour-long feature-length documentary. I think it, I honestly think it deserves one. Because in 1976, whether you like the film or not, this was one of the biggest films of the year. This was a marketing giant... There was a board game, there were lunch boxes, there were all kinds of merchandise. The movie was a hit. It cost $24 million to make and it made $90.6 million in the box office. That's a really good amount of money. That's, a, that's impressive for 1976. Adjusted to inflation, the budget was $101 million and its profit was $381 million. So it still made over $200 million in terms of profit. So it was a pretty big hit, financially. That's what makes it baffling to me that Paramount gives this bare bones when it's a movie that a lot of people, when they think of like 70s monster movies, when they think of like big films from the 70s, they think of King Kong. Understandably so. Because it was heavily marketed and it was a huge hit. So yeah, John Gillerman's direction, I do feel, is, is some of his finest work. He really does a good job with setting up his shots. He adds some nice uh, directorial techniques here and there uh, in terms of the way he sets up his shots. And he really works really well with his actors, gets the most out of them, especially as well as the locations. Um, his direction, though, is really, it, I think, is great. But I think that the cinematography by Richard H. Klein is just one step above. This cinematography is some of the most underrated work from a cinematographer I can think of. Richard H. Klein's cinematography is one of the many things that really brought Kong to life in this movie. Uh, there, it was there, yes, a lot of the effects were. Rick Baker in a King Kong suit. But 
Richard H. Klein's cinematography is what really gave the sequences with Kong an extra added weight to them. He did a great job setting up his shots and everything. So, and with the lighting and, and with the way he decided to use a lot of close ups of Kong's eyes, I thought it was a brilliant touch. And he really did add a lot of personality and mood and atmosphere to this film and to the scenes with Kong that wouldn't be there if he didn't lend his hand and his touch to the film. John did an amazing job directing the movie, don't get me wrong. It's just Richard H. Klein's cinematography just took it to a whole nother level. It took it to that epic level that the film needed to be at. The film also has a screenplay by Lorenzo Semple Jr., and for the most part, thematically, it's pretty much the same movie as the 1933 film. Uh, a crew, they get on a ship, they head to Skull Island, they encounter Kong, they bring Kong back to New York. And Kong escapes and rampages through New York City, and he climbs a tall building and gets shot off the top of it. So, thematically, it's essentially the same, but there are enough differences that it isn't, it isn't the same movie. I would be more upset as a, as a new fan of the 1933 film, and even if I was a fan of the 1933 film before I saw this, I would be more upset if it was a shot-for-shot shot remake of that movie. This isn't that. It has, it's thematically similar, but it's not exactly the same because there are di it, it approaches things differently. Uh, you don't have Carl Denham. Instead, you have uh, Fred Wilson... Uh, who is uh, the head of this uh, oil company called Petrox, and he's trying to go to Skull Island because he thinks that there's a huge honeypot there, that he's going there in search of black gold. And Kong is not really the main thing. He's trying to find oil, and this ties in with the oil crisis that was going on at the time, because apparently this movie is supposed to take place in 1976. This is supposed to be taking place in modern day, when the film came out, which I thought was an interesting choice as well. So he goes to Skull Island looking for oil and it's a different sort of dynamic. It's a different, there's a different element there. Um, it, it's a complete, it's a different character than Carl Denham as well. You have Jack Prescott, but Jack Prescott is also different. It's honestly a better character uh, in uh, this film. Uh, Jeff Bridges, his character Jack Prescott, he's a primatologist. He stows away on the Petrock Explorer because he hears that they're going to go to this island. He's heard about all these myths and all these legends about this giant ape, and he wants to go and see if he can discover it he, for himself and take photos and, and, and uh, research it and so on. So that character is much stronger than the Jack Prescott who was just one of the ship's crew in the 1933 film. Jessica Lange's character is also a little bit more different than Anne, played by Faye Ray. She's, uh, in a lot of ways, kind of, it's, she's different, but the same, kind of the same, but there's enough differences where I don't feel like they're the same character. She's a, a movie star as well. She wants to be, she wants to be a star like uh, Anne did, but uh, they're not making a movie. That's not the whole thing, because in the 1933, 1933 film, Carl Denham wants to make a movie, go to Skull Island, perfect way, perfect place to shoot a movie at, and he takes her along for the ride. This one, she's found in a raft, unconscious, left for dead. She basically falls into their laps, and then she's just taken on for the ride, and the she ends up getting taken by the natives, and Kong takes her, and and Kong becomes infatuated with her. So it, it's, in essence, the same sort of thing that goes on with Anne, but Dwan is, is a different... The, the, her personality is much different than uh, Anne. She's more of a, shall we say, kind of bimbo-ish, to be perfectly honest. I mean, when you have lines like this, I, I'm, I'm sure, sure you've never met someone who who's had their lives saved by deep throat. You know, you know, you have that kind of line of dialogue, and there's all these different shots in the film where it's just cheesecake, but it actually works because, hot damn, Jessica Lange was hot to trot in this movie. Woo! I mean, yeah, I can see why people remember her very fondly in this film. And I can see why Kong became uh, particularly uh, infatuated with her. Uh, and, and, and 
she does a good job for what she's asked to do. The script gives her a lot of cheesecake stuff, gives her a lot of just light lines of dialogue that are honestly kind of lame, like, Oh, Kong, don't you see? This is never going to work. <laughs> um, but uh, she manages to still leave an impact because... She's such a gorgeous woman, and that's the whole point. She's supposed to be this woman who's so beautiful that she's able to transcend the animal kingdom or something like that. You know, to be able to get, like, even even this giant ape it wants to get in her pants. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the characters I personally thought were a bit stronger here than... They were in the 1933 film. There was more to these characters. There was more character development. The romance between Dwan and Jack is stronger than the romance between Anne and Jack in the first one. Because Anne and, and, and Jack in the first one, they just randomly fall in love. That's all that happens. It's not really anything. It, it's just... Yeah, I mean, it, it's there's not much to that romance. It was just boom. And... and uh, the name is different, too. Bruce Cabot played Jack Driscoll in the first one, and this is Jack Prescott. So, his name is Jack, but he's a different character. And, of course, you have the different climax, where instead of the Empire State Building, it's the World Trade Center, which was an inspired choice. Yes, in retrospect, you can look back at it and be like, Oh, the World Trade Center! I don't understand how people can look back at older films that have the World Trade Center in them, and then be like, this is, I can't watch this. I, I don't, I don't get it because personally, yes, it's a tragedy, but this is back in a time where the World Trade Center was, was still there and it doesn't make any sense to retroactively condemn a film or to say, oh, that's, that's taboo for it to have the World Trade Center in it during a time period when the World Trade Center still existed and did not get attacked by terrorists. And, and also, I think it would be better for us to remember the building and to, you know, it, it was a, an amazing work of architecture and, and, and a huge part of American history, uh, architectural history. So for, to just ignore it and act like it was always destroyed, I just don't, I don't really understand that logic by some people. And not everybody does that. But I know there are people who see movies like this and see the World Trade Center and it takes them out of the film. But for me, it doesn't because this is of its time. I can't I can't look at this movie and be like, oh no, that's the the World Trade Center. What what? It's not it's not really that big of a deal because the World Trade Center was still there in that time period, and it was actually a really cool, inspired choice. And I love how they tied it in with how the World Trade Center reminded Kong of uh, these stone pillars uh, that were essentially his home. Uh, he would hang out in this area with these giant stone pillars. So that reminded him, the World Trade Center, the two towers, the twin towers reminded him of those two twin pillars, stone, stone pillars. So, and I also liked how with the script... It had some. It had a lot of fun with with the concept. It's a, a movie about a giant hairy ape. I mean, you got to have some fun with it. Now, it's uh, there were times though where it had a bit too much fun. It was a bit too campy for my tastes. With way too many monkey puns that really got cringe inducing, like estimated monkey time, blah blah blah. I'm just like, oh, estimated monkey time? Are you really kidding? You gotta be fucking kidding me with estimated monkey time. Oh, next time you see that uh, ape, you know, set the charges and monkey go bang bang. You, you know, they keep going a monkey, and I'm like, he's not. He's an ape. He's a gorilla. He's not a giant monkey. They're a completely different species. <laughs> But I can see what they're doing, you know. I, I, was, I, I honestly would not have been surprised if there was a scene in the film and in the script where Charles S. Grodin just grabbed a megaphone and was speaking to his workers who were working on setting up the charges to trap Kong. And he just grabbed the megaphone and was just like, Stop monkeying around! <laughs> I, I mean, I, I totally could have seen that in the movie because this was very campy. 
But there were some things that really added to it. I mean, I admit it. I do. I did like the whole Saved by Deep Throat thing. I thought that was funny. There were, you know, some nice fun lines by Jeff Bridges. Uh, the the whole character of Fred S. Wilson that Charles Grodin plays was a laugh riot. He was just this over the top sleaze bag, and it was he was definitely a guy, a villain that you love to hate. And he was different enough from Carl Denham that it didn't seem like it was the same character. They're trying to do the same thing. And Charles S. Grodin just Charles Grodin is just great in anything usually. And this is definitely one of my favorite roles of his is as Fred S. Wilson, uh, the the entrepreneur uh, oil tycoon. So, um, so yeah, there were some campy moments that didn't work with the script, but there were other ones that did. So it, it had this balance of camp and seriousness that at times worked and at times it didn't, which is makes it kind of a positive and a negative. But for the most part, I thought the script by uh, Lorenzo Semple Jr. was solid. Uh, the cast... For the most part, it's the main cast that really has the most impact for me. Jeff Bridges, it's actually one of my favorite performances from him as Jack Prescott. He's a very likable character. Uh, he's got his whole grisly, gr wannabe Grizzly Adams look with the beard and long hair. He, uh, he, had most of the, he had most of the best lines of dialogue for me. I like the back and forth between him and Charles Grodin. Um, and I thought he and Jessica Lange had some great chemistry with one another. So, and it is very unique to see Jeff Bridges in this type of film. Jeff Bridges doesn't really do a lot of movies like King Kong anymore, so that's a nice film to look back at uh, when it comes to Jeff Bridges' career. Charles Grodin, like I said earlier, is great as Fred S. Wilson. Uh, Jessica Lange is Drop Dead Gorgeous as Dwan. Uh, John Randolph, he, he was, he was alright as Captain Ross. He was just there, he was just kind of a rock. He was a solid character. Um... Rene Abrajones, I think that's the guy who played uh, the, the the scientist guy who was like all making sure that the oil was real oil. And then there was a fun scene where he was completely just, he basically told um, Fred that it's it's not ready. That there's oil here, but it's not ready yet. You're going to have to give it a few thousand years and then you'll be able to use oil um, because it cannot be refined. And it was fun to see actors like Ed Lauder as uh, the first mate Carnahan and Jack O'Halloran, who you might be, I was familiar with because he was, uh, I believe he was non in Superman 2. So it was nice to see him in a different role uh, where he wasn't playing one of the evil Kryptonians. And uh, you also had John Lone, who would go on to be in a few other films. I think John Lone, wasn't he the villain in The Shadow or a different yeah, he was the villain. He was Shwin Khan, Shwin Khan in The Shadow. You also had John Agar as a city official. You had uh, Corbin Burnson in an uncredited role as a reporter. And I didn't even recognize him. It must have been a very just blink and you miss it cameo. You also had Joe Piscopo as an, an uncredited role as a bit part, which is funny because there's a skit in season six of SNL where Joe Piscopo is all acting like he's King Kong, which is kind of ironic since he was in King Kong. And of course, you also have Rick Baker, who was uncredited as King Kong. He played the man inside the King Kong suit. And Rick really did bring his all to Kong. He, You could tell he was passionate about the film. He really did everything he could to bring... Kong to life and to work inside of this very uncomfortable hot and heavy suit uh Rick Baker went through hell making this movie he had to go and be in this hairy hot and heavy suit that was extremely uncomfortable for hours and hours on end he couldn't really eat anything in it he couldn't even go to the bathroom that it was just extremely impractical it didn't help either that there were crew members who were just screwing with him. Like they, they, one time there was like one day of shooting and it was like hours of shooting in this suit, in the Kong suit. And some of the crew decided it would be funny to uh, prank Rick Baker by, you know, leaving for lunch and then just leaving bananas for him to eat. 
which is extremely cruel because he couldn't eat the bananas because the suit did not enable him to to be able to do that. And then he had to wear these extremely uncomfortable and painful scleral contact lenses that give him, you know, these ape-like gorilla eyes. And he had to wear them for a lot longer than you're supposed to. So there would be times... So, you know, he'd get done with shooting and he would have to drive home and it was it literally took a miracle for him to get home safely because he's just the scleral contact lenses have completely fucked up his eyes like he he's seeing like white circles he's seeing all kinds of spots and stuff and lights are like blurry it's like he can barely even see and he's driving down the road trying to get home it, it's just he li- he did he went through hell making this movie and he didn't get credited for playing Kong. And I understand why they did that. They wanted to, you know, keep the mystique of, oh, it's not a guy in a suit, you know. But still, I mean, I have to give Rick his just credit and his and his just desserts and, and everything that he deserves for his extremely hard work for this performance in the Kong suit. Because I don't think there's a lot enough people who give him credit for that. And I definitely wanted to do that. Because he's one of the most important actors in the film is is Rick Baker playing Kong, doing everything he can to make Kong more than just a guy in a suit. And it helps that he had studied primates uh, and and ape uh, movements and things like that, and so on. And Carlo Rombaldi did a good job with the suit as well. And it, it honestly, for a man in an ape suit, it's really impressive. I still think it looks great to this day. I don't understand the the backlash people have towards this suit now like oh it's just a man in the suit oh it's i've never seen a man in an ape suit that looked this good the design was great it was fantastic the the motions they were able to get out of the face was unheard of back then to have an animatronic head that had all these different emotions and so on for the ape to the actor in the suit to display uh and then you also had the giant mock-up uh, hands of Kong that were used for a lot of different sequences, and th- that was, those are still impressive to this day to see them in action. And yeah, there are some noticeable moments of blue screening, but this is 1976. I mean, this was state of the art for 1976, and I could see why it won the best o- uh, the Oscar for best special effects because there wasn't anything even remotely close to King Kong that year. That you could say deserve the Oscar for best visual effects. So, yeah, I mean, there were some things like the snake, which looked faker than Kong, which is crazy. This is snake, this giant snake he fights look fa- looks faker than the the Kong suit. But, you know, I, I still had some fun with that scene. But that's also kind of a negative, and I'll get to that later. But, yeah, I just wanted to throw that stuff out there. Uh, those stories about Rick Baker always stuck with me when I read them in a book called Men Make Up and Monsters, where he's talking about his experience playing Kong and how miserable it was and so on. And, and it is, it's shocking, everything that he went through. And, but, you know, it wasn't for naught because his performance does show up on film. Kong, to me, was brought to life by Rick Baker and by Carl Rambaldi and the people who worked with the suit and also of course the cinematographer Richard H. Klein and but Rick is the one that really gave Kong his heart because without a human being in that suit you really don't have that connection that that you that I personally got with the film Kong was the most sympathetic for me in this movie because I they just did a great job showing the emotions on his face and it just made the ending of the film so much more tragic. And it also helps that the ending is just extremely brutal and bloody. Kong gets ripped to shreds by these helicopters at the end of the movie. And it's gory as hell. He's getting popped by these machine gun bullets. And it's just blood squibs everywhere. It is a really intense, brutal sequence. And it, this is ruthless in its execution. And it's very effective. Which makes the sequel and his bullshit of, oh, he had a heart transplant, he's not dead. 
hurts the ending in the film, but that's just because of the sequel, which admittedly I could still watch as a guilty pleasure, but I have a lot of problems with that. Much more problems with King Kong Lives than I do with King Kong. But yeah, the cast all do their jobs really well, for the most part. And the scenes with Kong, they are a spectacle. I mean, the Kong shows up about 50 minutes into the movie, similar to how he shows up to when he shows up in the 1933 film. And he shows up and he's like moving trees over and makes his entrance. And it's pretty awe-inspiring, even for just for a guy in a suit. The sound design was pitch perfect. They did a great job. Uh, really amplifying Kong's size and his movements and and whenever he makes a step it thunders and uh, I really liked the way that they created the the roars for Kong there were some though like there was one near the end and in the New York City where he roars and then he does like something that sounds like a cat roaring and it was a it was absolutely just a lion or something that was the only problem I had with that with the sound design because that was like one glaringly obvious moment where they just spliced in some lion roars and just said fuck it. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean the 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 finale in New York is really worth the wait. It is great. I love it. You know, he's smacking helicopters, he's smashing the building. He's ripping the the train apart, grabbing, you know, grabbing people it had and there were some nice homages to the original in this that didn't feel like it was just the original it's just xeroxing things like when he grabs a girl and realizes it's not dwan and drops her like a bad habit or the scene where these people are trying to get away on this log and he goes in and t tosses them off i actually think this film the screenplay uh lorenzo semple jr improved upon that scene in the remake here because what he did is he made it so it made more sense that Kong would do what he did. They shot, they shot at him. So it makes sense that he'd be like, oh, I, no, you didn't, and then send them flying to their deaths. In the 1933 film, he just shows up and just attacks them. It just, it just says a savage beast. Here, it's just like, you shot me. Don't do that. I'm going to show you to not shoot me. So it, it, it makes it so it's more of like self-defense. And also it's more shocking because you had Ed Lauder's character actually dies in this scene, which still to this day really surprises me because it, it seemed like he was built up as one of the main characters and he dies. And the black guy, he lives. The black guy doesn't die. The black guy is not the first one to die. And I don't even think he dies at all, really. Remember correctly? The actor played by Julius, uh, the character Bone played by Julius Harris. Yeah, he lives. So, I mean, yeah, you got to kind of, there's some horror elements here and the black guy doesn't die, which is different. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to like about this film. I love the locations. I love that they shot on location in Hawaii. It really was a perfect place, a perfect setting for Skull Island. Uh, I love the, the way the film builds up to getting to Skull Island. It's perfectly mysterious. I love how it starts out with uh, them getting ready to go off on the Petrix Explorer and to go on this mission to Skull Island. I, I really love the opening, the way the film opens up. I Arguably, I think the script and the story has a stronger first half than it does a middle. And then the ending, I think, is ad, the last half is as strong as the first half for me. It's just the middle that needed some work. But, yeah, I love the first half, the mysterious aspect of it. I, I love the, the scene where Jeff Bridges... He, while there, there's this whole debriefing of what the mission, the mission is going to be, and Jack Prescott comes in and he interrupts the briefing, and they're all, because they're all talking about how uninhabited the, the the island is and so on, and he comes in with, with this epic introduction. It, he, this is his, uh, Jeff Bridges' first lines in the film too, and I'm not so sure human feet have never walked on that island before. You see, in 1605, Pierre Fernandez de Quérez was blown south from Timatang. He wrote in his log of piercing the White Veil. That's obviously the cloud bank. And the landing on the beach of the skull. 
where he heard the roar of the greatest beast. The rest of that log entry, unfortunately, was suppressed by the Holy Office in Rome. Who are you? In 1749, a waterlogged lifeboat was found in the same area. It was empty, but drawn in blood, and the thwart was the likeness of some huge, slouchy humanoid thing. And the strange warning, from the wedding with the creature who touches heaven, Lady, God, preserve thee. I also heard a note in a bottle written by a dying Japanese submariner in 1944. I haven't been able to track that one down. So I really liked his, I, I just automatically, I, I love that scene. I love that line delivery by Jeff Bridges. And then right from that moment, he was my favorite character. And I just really liked this character and this performance. I, he was just this kind of adventurous explorer guy who snuck on this clandestine mission and uh, tagged along and, and became a big part of it. So just the mysterious stuff about it was great. And then the score by John Barry, which is phenomenal. It's some of his finest work, especially the love theme for the movie. It has the size and scope you need for a film like this. And it also has a, a nice amount of heart to it, which was, which was a really nice touch. And so, I mean, yeah, there's just so many things about this movie that work for me. You know, the art direction, the production design. Uh, I like the look of the natives on Skull Island. Uh, the, the whole chanting and stuff they do with Kong. And, and the giant wall, the matte painting of that was pretty cool. Because it's really, it's really nice to see matte paintings. You know, stuff you don't see nowadays anymore. And, you know, the stuff with the miniatures and stuff that with, with Kong... The way that they shot these scenes, there were certain shots that you could not tell that it was a guy in a suit. I mean, that goes, the credit to that goes to the direction, to the people working on the effects, and to the cinematographer. And even with all these things, with all these things to like about the film, there are some things that bring it down for me. And I would have to say those things would be this. One of the main things is its tone. It's not consistent. Like I said earlier, it's one of those things where it works and then it doesn't. So you have the campy tone that at times works and then it doesn't. And then it takes you away from the film. It kind of takes me out of the movie. There were times where it just... That unnecessary scene where Fred is talking about how Kong tried to rape Dwan. He tried to rape you. It was just like not needed. And what, what you've seen, Kong wasn't even trying to even rape her at all. Like he copped a feel, but who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want to cop a feel on some Jessica Lang tit in this movie? Some prime Jessica Lang titty. Um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, that was just not needed. And there were just a few other moments that just didn't quite click for me. Uh, mainly, yeah, th this scene, this whole scene is just silly and stupid. Where Jessica Lang uh, gets dropped in a waterfall... Because Kong's washing her off because she got muddy. And then he blow dries her with his breath. That scene is a horrible... That is a horrible scene. I never liked that scene even when, I was a even when I was a kid. It is so goofy. I mean... She <laughs> Jessica Lang's in Kong's palm and he's like... And then he's all has this like stupid smile on his face. <laughs> it's so bad. It's such a bad scene. Um, so yeah, scenes like that definitely did take me out of the movie. I also felt the pacing could have been better. I really do. Um, the first 30 minutes, bam, great. They get on Skull Island 30 minutes into the movie. They're... The first, Kong shows up 50 minutes in. It's just when Kong shows up, when he makes his first appearance, the film then starts to amazingly slow down to a crawl for me. It's crazy how Kong shows up and the movie is less engaging and less exciting than it was when Kong wasn't on screen. I think it's because they just have a lot of stuff with this mechanical hand and a lot of stuff with the silly shit with Kong blowing Jessica Lang. Uh... And, uh, you know, stuff where you have, it just, there should be more action here. Like in the 1933 film, Kong is like fighting dinosaurs or the people on uh, the crew members are fighting dinosaurs or there's something more to it. And all you get is like the scene where Kong throws the guys off the log 
and Kong fights a giant snake. It needed one, it needed a couple more big, grand, spectacle, monster bashing moments. It, you know, the, just one fight with a snake, it wasn't enough for me. Especially for a King Kong movie. So that was ultimately disappointing. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's just the tone, it's the pacing, and I could use more action. Those are the main problems I have with the movie. It's too silly at times in terms of its tone, uh, and the, it could be tighter paced. It's a little bit too long. It's like 134 minutes, which is a bit too long for this movie. And could have used a bit more action in the middle of the movie, because I think that would have really balanced things out better. But overall, though, I'm a fan of this King Kong. I always have been, and I always will be. Always, I will always have a special place in my heart for this remake. Uh, I think it's a fun time at the movies. I think it's an entertaining epic, and... I don't know what else to say about the film, except if I was going to rate it out of five stars, I would give the movie four out of five stars. I think it's that solid of a movie, and I definitely do feel that it's one of the better remakes out there, not one of the worst. And if you haven't seen it in a while, I do recommend you check it out again. And if you've never seen it, I definitely do recommend this one. So, um, anyway, thank you for watching my review of King Kong, and as always, I will see you guys later. See ya.